In the grand collage of human cultures, some identities are so distinct, so visually powerful, that they seem to be cut from a different cloth. For 500 years, the Sikh people of the Punjab have been one such group. Their identity, symbolized by the turban and the warrior steel, is unmistakable. This powerful distinction raises a fundamental question, a puzzle that lies at the heart of their origins. Is there a biological basis for this uniqueness? A secret bloodline? A specific genetic signature that separates the Sikhs from the myriad of other groups in the region? This is the 500-year-old genetic mystery of the Sikhs. To solve it, we must first journey into the very code of life itself. Before we can look for a unique gene, we must first understand the genetic landscape of the Punjab. Think of this region not as a single place, but as a historical superhighway. For at least 9,000 years, waves of humanity have washed over it. First, ancient farmers from the Iranian plateau mixed with the indigenous hunter-gatherers who had been there for millennia. Together, they laid the foundation for the great Indus Valley civilization. Then, around 4,000 years ago, Indo-European-speaking pastoralists from the Central Asian steppe arrived, bringing new languages and genes. They were followed by Persians, Greeks, Kushones, Huns, Turks, and Afghans. The Punjab is not a gene pool, it's a genetic ocean, a complex mixture of West and South Asian DNA. So, the first logical step in our investigation is to search this genetic ocean for a unique island. Scientists can do this by tracing paternal lineages through the white chromosome and maternal lineages through mitochondrial DNA. If the Sikhs emerged from a distinct ethnic stock, we would expect to find a dominant haplogrupa, sort of ancestral clan marker, as common among them but rare in their neighbors. However, when researchers have conducted these analyses, the data consistently reveals a startling conclusion. The colored dots representing Sikh individuals don't form their own separate cluster. Instead, they land directly on top of the clusters for other Punjabi communities, whether Hindu or Muslim, from both India and Pakistan. Their paternal DNA is a mosaic. It contains lineages linked to the steppe Aryans, to the farmers of West Asia, and to the most ancient peoples of the subcontinent. There is no single Sikh founding father in the genetic record. The science is unequivocal. This forces us to reframe our entire investigation. The mystery is not what is in their DNA. The real mystery is why their identity became so powerful despite their DNA being a reflection of the region. If the answer doesn't lie in genetics, we must look for it in the forces of history and in the revolutionary power of a new idea. Our story begins in the late 15th century. It was a world of walls, both visible and invisible. The Delhi Sultanate, a Turco-Afghan Islamic dynasty, ruled over a majority Hindu population. Society was fractured by religion and stratified by the ancient Hindu caste system, which dictated a person's profession, social standing, and very worth from birth. Into this divided world, new spiritual currents were flowing. Muslim Sufi mystics and Hindu Bhakti saints were challenging religious dogma, emphasizing personal devotion over rigid ritual. As the Sikh writer Kushwant Singh memorably put it, Sikhism was born out of wedlock between Hinduism and Islam. It drew from these reformist movements, but it would synthesize them into something far more radical. The founder of this new path was Guru Nanak. After a profound mystical experience, he emerged with a simple yet world-shattering message. Ik Ankar, there is one God and there is no Hindu, there is no Muslim. He taught that all human divisions, caste, creed, gender, were illusions blocking humanity from the universal truth. But Guru Nanak didn't just preach this, he engineered a society around it. He created the institution of the Langar, the free community kitchen. This was not simply an act of charity, it was a radical act of social demolition. In a time when even the shadow of a low-caste person was considered polluting to a high-caste Brahmin, the Langar forced everyone to sit on the floor as equals and share the same meal. It was a physical and symbolic destruction of the caste system, and the primary tool for forging a new egalitarian community. This revolutionary equality was so potent that even the Emperor of India, Akbar the Great, submitted to it. On a visit to the third guru, he was informed that he must first eat in the Langar, before being granted an audience. And so, one of the most powerful men in the world sat on the floor with peasants and ate as their equal. It was a golden age of mutual respect, but it was not destined to last. 
The peace was shattered in 1606. Emperor Jahangir, less tolerant than his father, grew suspicious of the Sikhs' growing influence. Accusing the fifth guru, Arjan Dev, of aiding a rebellious son, he ordered his arrest and execution. It was a defining act of state brutality. According to tradition, Guru Arjan was martyred by being made to sit on a burning hot griddle. This event was the catalyst. It taught the nascent Sikh community a brutal lesson. To survive, spiritual strength had to be matched by martial strength. Guru Arjan's son and successor, Guru Hargobind, responded by transforming the faith. At his succession, he famously wore two swords, one for Piri, spiritual authority, and one for Miri, temporal authority. The era of the saint soldier had begun. The Sikhs were no longer just a spiritual commune. They were now a people prepared to defend their existence. The persecution culminated decades later under the reign of the zealous emperor Aurangzeb. In one of history's most remarkable acts of self-sacrifice, the ninth guru, Teg Bahadur, interceded on behalf of a group of Hindu Brahmins who were being forcibly converted to Islam. He offered his own head to protect the religious freedom of another faith. For this, he was arrested and publicly beheaded in Delhi. His martyrdom sent a shockwave across India. It now fell to his son, the 10th Guru, Gobind Singh, to lead a people who had been twice brutalized by the state. He realized that to ensure the survival of Sikhism for all time, the community itself had to become an eternal institution, a nation that could outlive any single guru. He needed to forge them into something new, something unbreakable. In the spring of 1699, Guru Gobind Singh called a massive gathering. He stood before the crowd, drew his sword and made a shocking demand. He asked for a volunteer willing to offer their head as a human sacrifice for the faith. A fearful silence gripped the assembly. Eventually, one man stood up. The guru led him into a tent. Moments later, he emerged with a blood-drenched sword. He demanded another head. And then another. Five times, brave souls volunteered their lives. Five times, the guru seemed to execute them. After the fifth apparent sacrifice, the guru re-entered the tent and emerged with all five men, alive and dressed in magnificent new attire. He had not killed them. He had tested their devotion to the point of death. He called them the Panj PR, the Five Beloved Ones. They would be the foundation of a new order. This event was the crucible where the modern Sikh identity was forged. Guru Gobinda Singh initiated these five into the Khalsa, a new caseless society of warrior saints. First, the baptism. He administered Amrit, sweetened water stirred with a double-edged sword, symbolizing the blend of compassion and martial strength. Second, the new identity. He abolished their caste-based surnames, giving all initiated men the name Singh and all women Kaur. In one stroke, he erased centuries of social hierarchy. Third, the uniform. He mandated the five Kazan cut hair, a comb, a steel bracelet, soldier's undergarment, and a ceremonial dagger. This was not just a dress code. It was a uniform that made the Khalsa instantly recognizable and publicly accountable for their actions. They could no longer hide. This was not a gradual evolution. It was a deliberate, revolutionary act of nation building. Guru Gobind Singh had created a self-sustaining, sovereign community bound by a common code and a visible identity designed to withstand persecution and outlive its leaders. And so, we arrive at the solution to our 500-year-old mystery. The unparalleled distinctiveness of the Sikh people does not come from a unique genetic marker or a separate bloodline. It comes from one of the most extraordinary processes of social and spiritual engineering in human history. The raw material was the diverse gene pool of the Punjab. The catalyst was brutal persecution, and the forging was a deliberate act of genius, creating a new people based not on what was in their veins, but on the ideals they held in their hearts. The Sikhs built a fortress, but it was not a fortress of genetics. It was a fortress of belief, defended by a brotherhood of lions and princesses. Their story is a powerful testament to the idea that the strongest identities are not the ones we are born with, but the ones we consciously choose to build.